Whereas in Roman Catholicism, there is the belief that one could have all of the faith correct and be completely heart-wise having no love for God. And so it would be purely intellectual or something like that. Well, Orthodoxy would even say that dead faith can't be purely intellectual. Or that you can't have correct knowledge of God without a correct repentance or seeking of God. And for Luther and for Calvin and for all those pers- those early reformers, well, it becomes the guys who are the most studied academic humanists of their day, right? The humanist movement, which stressed reading the Greek text, reading the Hebrew text, the original languages and all this, right? And so there's a loss of the idea of the metaphysical ideas of union with God, and it all becomes a kind of rational, propositional, legal category. And this is an area where St. Gregory is prophetic. St. Gregory actually says to Barlaam, if you continue with your presuppositions, he says, it, it leads to atheism. And what happened in the West was the continuance of the essence, the, the substance of Barlaam's presuppositions, and it led to atheism. This is Global Storyline with your host, Dean W. Arnold, where we examine events current and past and place them in the Global Storyline. All right, our guest this this evening is uh, Jay Dyer, uh, many of you are familiar with. He's the uh, proprietor and founder of jaysanalysis.com, which is a uh, odyssey of all sorts of information, uh, film analysis, geopolitics, esoterica, philosophy, theology, corruption theory, uh, about any kind of information you're looking about on a knowledge level, uh, Jay is into it, and he's been doing it for a lot of years. Uh, you can subscribe there at jaysanalysis.com for four ninety five a month, best deal in the universe. Encourage people to do that. He's also Thank got a you. what's that? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the uh, really is man. I mean, there's nothing else out there that covers everything. Um, you're, uh, you got a book coming out soon, uh, almost here, almost here, uh, Esoteric Hollywood, um, and you can order that uh, on Amazon. Can you pre-order it, pre-order it at Jay's Analysis? Uh, yeah, there's a link that just takes you to the publisher there, a picture of the book, yeah. Trine Day? Uh-huh. Right. Um, and so uh, uh, he, uh, he's also uh, working on a TV project that uh, we're going to... Get get to see at some point. So you want to tell us about that? Uh, it'll be I think thirteen episodes with me and uh, Jay Weedner, uh, the guy who directed a couple famous documentaries on Kubrick, uh, Kubrick's Odyssey. And he, I've flown up to Boulder to the studios where he works uh, a couple times. Did uh, some shows with a woman named Regina Meredith and with Sean Stone, Oliver Stone's son, and we had a great time. It looks like we're going to do basically Esoteric Hollywood, I believe is what it'll be called at this point. And we'll have 13 episodes where we pick uh, 13 films or themes or directors, who knows, and we'll just kind of do what I do and and what he does, and we'll dissect them, kind of explain the symbolism, maybe Blade Runner or stuff like that. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And that will be through Gaia TV, which uh, unfortunately it is a streaming subscription service, so it's not going to be you know on network TV or anything like that. But they have a pretty big audience uh, for what it is, and so yeah. Were, uh, uh, were you were you chilling and hanging out with Sean? Story. Were you chilling and hanging out with Sean Stone, or or just did you just do the shows? Uh, no, we we hung out the night before and got beer and chatted and. Talked about Oliver Stone a lot. Talked about his dad's movies and projects that uh, Sean has worked on, and we had a really good time. Cool. He, he's a really, really sharp guy. So Oliver Stone's not part of the Illuminati. He's he's the, he's the real deal. He didn't really go into. Uh, no, I don't think he would say that about his dad. But he, we talked about the films, and then we kind of just branched off into you know every other subject under the sun. So. Um, I like Oliver think, Stone, but um, some people yeah, are, some people are critical. Really, really good director, absolutely. And you know, Sean, Sean's been in some of his films, so we got to discuss some of those experiences. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, 
The other thing I'll say about Jay in the intro here, intro here is that he's a uh, he's a superb teacher of complex thoughts, uh, and uh, I just finished watching for the second time. Actually, the first time I listened to it, uh, your uh, basic metaphysics uh, double video, uh, cool. and uh, and and so I, I learned all sorts of things, basic things. But then the crazy thing was, um, I was laughing out loud uh, all throughout the video too. So you got a gift of uh, making us laugh while we're also learning some of the most uh, arguably boring things you can deal with but also important things so um yeah uh well i don't think it's boring but then again not everybody is you know made for technical theology so i don't know yeah i guess it takes it takes a certain type of person uh the first time i, I watched the basic metaphysics i actually listened to it as a podcast i, I didn't know it was a video mm -hmm. and and throughout the thing i was like why does it keep banging on his desk <laughs> But actually, you had this marker board, and you kept you kept banging yeah. on certain parts of the marker board. But I didn't figure that out until like near the end. Um, all right, so what we're going to be doing here in this podcast is a little, little bit more like um, the uh, teaching videos and the uh, the basic metaphysics uh, that I was really impressed with, and um, and we're going to talk about uh, the the working title I have for this is um, it's a little uh, it's a little abrasive. Um, Catholics caused Modern atheism and Protestants didn't fix it. Um, that's my that's my working title. Let me say it again: Catholics caused modern atheism and Protestants didn't fix it. Uh, that kind of gives you gives us something to sort of hone in on the problem and what we're talking about. Um, but I uh, I like this subject for a whole lot of reasons. Um, one is this uh, <clears throat> this podcast is called Global Storyline. And this is one of the largest, longest overview global storylines we're going to deal with, which is dealing with a philosophical controversy that started in the, I don't know, uh, you could argue about where it started, but let's just say 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. And uh, and now we're seeing the fruits of it today. So it's a, it's a very long, comprehensive story. Uh, I also like it because... Um, my world's Protestants. So I don't hang out with a lot of Catholics. I know a lot of your argumentation, you're you're addressing Catholics, but Protestants, by and large, they don't even know that the schism happened in a thousand A.D. They don't know that the Catholic Church broke away from the Mother Church, um, and and when when you first learn that as a Protestant, I think the light kind of comes on because Protestants want to get back to the ancient Church and they want to get back to some kind of authority. Uh, in the church, you know, apostolic secession, that kind of thing. But they don't want to be Catholic. Uh, they don't want to be Catholic because they don't like the whole Pope thing. Uh, who does? You know, the, they don't like, um, uh, some of them don't like the Crusades, some obviously things like indulgences, other kinds of uh, corruptions that developed. So when they find out that there's a way to do apostolic secession and have the authority of, of a his, uh, unbroken thread and you don't have to be Catholic, the light comes on and it's a pretty big deal. Now, uh, one of the things you're going to tell us in this podcast is that it's not just uh, the East and West split is not just over whether the Pope's in charge or not, um, and it's not just uh, uh, people who know a little bit more about it uh, know that there's this controversy called the Filioque, which is adding a clause to the creed and the son. We can get into the technicals of that, but... Some people think that that's really getting into the deeper thing of the schism, but you're going to tell us about uh, really something even more important and deeper, which is the divide between East and West. Uh, and and so we're going to talk about that today, which <clears throat> I'm going to say, uh, so this is this theological controversy, which basically um, is basically saying you can't know God directly, you can only know him through sensory data, empiricism, that this, through a long domino effect, led to deism, led to uh, uh, rationalism, led to uh, modern atheism. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and it's a long process, but because the Western Church, the Catholic Church, pulled away from the Mother Church, they got... This, they got uh, disconnected. The umbilical cord to truth got disconnected, and some very important philosophical underpinnings got shed uh, 
which led to where we are today. Now, I'm, I didn't do a very good of ex job of explaining it, Jay, but I wanted to kind of set it up a little bit. Um, I uh, <clears throat> And then I want to show you, I, I, I made a little project for this. Um, can you see this? I made a, uh, it's a timeline, but I, I call it a time decline mm -hmm. um, because it starts with Jesus. Actually, at the very tip top, you can see that there's a, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you can see yeah, that so there's that uh, right. Plato and Aristotle, but you start with Jesus, and yeah. we'll hear a little bit about some of these guys, Gregory the Theologian, Basil and Augustine, and some of the good guys, Maximus the Confessor in the 7th century, John of Damascus in the 8th. Here we have the schism uh, around 1000, and, uh, and then we're going to hear about Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic uh, leader and thinker, who uh, kind of laid the foundation for this false philosophical and theological theory. He was refuted by an Orthodox saint named Gregory Palama, Palamas. Uh, and then you have the Reformation, and the Reformers basically followed Aquinas and his rationalism. Uh, uh, you'll tell us about Immanuel Kant and how he basically turned it into nominalism, I think is the right word. Uh, and then all the way to the very bottom, because of the decay of culture and the atheism, we have Lady Gaga, and we've got the Masonic Eye. So it's all right there. I call it the time decline, not the timeline. Um, it's funny that Gaga made it to the list there. That's funny. Yeah, well, that, I've, never that, seen a, I've never seen a list with Maximus the Confessor and Lady Gaga. Well, that just tells you how far we've we've gone and how bad it is. Um, that's funny. Uh, anyway, so that's my time decline, and yeah. uh, and once in a while when we talk about different figures, I'll throw up a picture just because it's nice to have pictures with all this abstraction. So this is, is Plato, this is Plato and Aristotle. When we get to them, I'll, I'll pick this up. But anyway, um, I have laid out a bunch of information. Why don't you begin by taking? We'll we'll uh, we'll take the second half of this show and get into the real details of this theological controversy. But take a few minutes now and and just. Give a do a better job than I did of the broad stroke of how this problem and what it is led to where we are today. And I know you can do this because I've seen you do it on other pad podcasts several times. Well, I think the the question is starting points. It's the question of presuppositions, and I always start with that. It's something I, I learned even as a Protestant. Uh, and something that many Eastern fathers also talk about in their writings, and that is questioning where we start from, because the worldview that we have, we're going to build it up based on those starting points, whether we recognize it or not. And I think that it's best understood if we consider how do we know God, and where do we get this knowledge, and how does it come to us, and how does God relate to the world? That's really the whole kit and caboodle of all of it. And that's what separates uh, the strands of Christian traditions, uh, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, as well as even other religions, uh, or at least the monotheistic ones. But uh, John Damascus, for example, has a book called On Heresies, and he actually, in a sense, says that all religious deviances or differences in theology can be boiled down to uh, what your view of God and the Incarnation is. And so any deviation on... John of Damascus, 8th century. There he is. Okay. Right. And John's very important because not only did he write one of the most famous, what you might call an early systematic theology called On the Orthodox Faith, but he also was very important in defending the iconology, right? The, the, idea, that, the idea that we are iconoduls, that we do reverence the sacramental and uh, deified nature of the, the fact that cre created matter can be deified. And that's the whole purpose of icons, and that's based on Christology and the Incarnation. So basically, everything in our theology will hang on, it'll hinge on the view of God and God's relationship to the world and principally in the Incarnation. Everything will hinge on that. All the theology, all the biblical theology, all the philosophy will hinge on that. So if I were to say what separates that our view from all the other ones, it's the relationship of philosophy to that, to that core thing that I said. So for some people, philosophy is equal, perhaps, to this, right? So you've got, yeah, you've got all this theology over here, but philosophy is just as important, and it can correct, it can cancel out, human reason can 
uh, even say that certain aspects of Scripture or are not revelation, uh, certain aspects of church history don't matter. They can be revised, redone, and this is what will become modernism. Right? This is in a movement in the 19th century. I'm not going to go too deep into this. I'm just saying that we nowadays live in the era of modernism in terms of biblical studies and theology, where that's the dominant view across the board in most academic religious theological circles. Um, obviously, each tradition, whether Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox, still has conservative or traditional circles. But the majority of those groups, much of it— um, and I would probably say orthodoxy is probably the most conservative out of these uh, in terms of the, the masses of numbers of people around. Uh, but for the most part, you've had a caving into the modernist views of Scripture, of the Church Fathers, of tradition, uh, of the liturgy, of whatever. So that's the big question here is what is the relationship, not just of philosophy and human reason and academic scholarship or whatever, or secular scholarship, whatever you want to call it, but uh, to what degree— and in what sense we can say we know God. That's yeah, really yeah if, and if I can interrupt you, and I don't want to butcher it, but but uh, <clears throat> the the ultimate controversy comes down to the historic church has taught that God uh, cannot be known in his essence, but he can be known in his energies. In other words, his energies, what he does, his attributes, his actions, these sorts of things. And that has been a historic Christian uh, teaching from the beginning, essence and energies. We, we can't know him in his essence. We can know him. We can actually know him, know God himself through his energies. And then that changed in the West, uh, and, and you can tell us how it developed, but Thomas Aquinas sort of uh, crystallized it uh, by saying that God in his essence is unknowable and then there is no separation of God, essence, and energy. Um, mm -hmm. We can't. They, they they said you can't do that because of what Plato and Aristotle taught us. That, yeah, that, exactly. So that's what you're saying when you're saying that the when they bring in the philosophy, what what what's the cart and what's the horse here? Right. Is it now, philosophy or is it scripture or is it is it the church fathers? Well, there's a dialectical relationship in a good sense, not a bad tension sense between the possibility of learning about the natural world or learning about philosophy or logic and studying scripture. St. Basil talks about that there's nothing wrong with having a classical education. There's nothing wrong with uh, reading through Plato or Aristotle or whatever. Uh, St. Gregory Palamas says this too. There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with the natural world or analytical reasoning or anything like that. The problem is that sometimes the tendency can be on the part of man's hubris to think that the speculations or the wisdom that might be there in some sense in pagan literature, that it can, it's really a question of degrees, I guess you could say, because obviously we wouldn't say that everything Plato said is wrong, but rather it's a question of, well, how do we know God? And there are basically two different views. And I would say that this is a, a strong issue of contention, uh, if Orthodox are faithful to their tradition, that separates them from Roman Catholic theology. Now, granted, there's a lot of similarities. So you're, if you, you know, most people are going to say things like, well, we know God through tradition and scripture, right? Now, people in both camps would say that. Protestants would say we know God through the Bible. It's not those sort of general statements that are problem. It's, it's more, what, what do you mean? So if we think about the Bible. Let's talk about the ways that we see God revealing himself in Scripture, because everybody agrees in some sense that Scripture tells us something about this. Well, we see that God names himself through things in words in Scripture, that he's holy, that he's just, that he's this and that, and that, for example, Mount Sinai, this is a famous uh, image that is used by the Eastern Fathers to picture the spiritual life. Moses is ascent on Mount Sinai. He sees God face to face, or in, a, in the truest sense, the backside of God. He comes down and his face shines, as St. Paul says, right, in 2 Corinthians. Now, that is the pattern of prototype, uh, we, we would say, of how we actually truly know God, right? Now, Moses is sent up the mountain and learning these things and receiving the tablets, the law, the word of God. Coming back to the people, that's obviously a type of Christ, who would be the new Moses, 
who would be God incarnate, giving us the word of God face to face, right? Just like Moses saw, not the face of God per se, but the backsides of God. Well, all the Eastern fathers teach that the backsides of God, his goodness, his mercy, etc., those are his energies. And what we mean by energies is just operations or actions of God. And we would, the reason we distinguish them from his essence, as all the Eastern fathers teach, is because if we think about human relationships, uh, you don't know, if I build a house, you might learn something about me. You might learn that I like to build my house shaped like a pyramid, like Nicholas Cage's tomb or something, right? <laughs> so you might, you might say, hey, this guy's house looks just like Nicholas Cage's tomb. He must be a Nicholas Cage fan. So you've learned something about me, but you haven't learned anything about my essence, right? And likewise, similarly, in this analogy that Gregor Nyssa uses, the action of me building the house is not the same thing as me. Now, this analogy, which is a cre creaturely analogy, it's based on human persons and how humans do things and operate and act, the Eastern Fathers say this is applicable to understanding God. In the same way, because we're made in the image of light and likeness of God, God is not the same thing as his actions. And this is a big, this is the, the starting point of the difference between the East and the West, and we'll get deeper into that. But so if God creates the world, we can learn some things about God through his creation, right? The heavens declare the glory of God, right? So in looking at and understanding creation, there's some backside of God, right? Like Moses talked about that in some way is an analogy to some truth about God, but it's not a disclosure or a full revelation of God. It's, it's, it's only a piece, if you will. It's only seeing through a glass darkly, as Paul says, right? Now, <clears throat> those truths or things that we see or learn are not merely truths of the intellect. And this is why, where another area where the East differs from the West is that the East believes that man is body, soul, and spirit. And this means that God endowed man with a faculty by which he might see him directly. And this is called the noose, right? And this is the idea of the mind and the heart working in harmony. And that is a patristic, it is a classical uh, orthodox teaching. And I would say that the scriptures teach it too when Paul talks about praying in the spirit. Yeah, the eye of the soul. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, this is different from Roman Catholicism because in Roman Catholicism, as an example, the tendency is to say that man is a body and a soul and that the soul slash intellect is the way that we learn discursive knowledge about God. And then by learning that discursive knowledge, we can move ourselves in a way towards God to receive his grace and that God will infuse our soul with some form of created justice or created love or so forth as Roman, Roman Catholicism teaches the infusion of grace into the soul. That's very different from the Eastern view. The Eastern view is that there is a synergy that man does participate in this relationship, this communion with God, uh, but it's at, an, uh, it's at the level of energy. And what we learn and know about God is the noose, the, mi the mind's eye, as you said, uh, working in tandem with the heart. So you can't, for example, not have any sincere repentance or sincere seeking of the truth and at the same time come to correct knowledge about God, you see. Whereas in Roman Catholicism, there is the belief that one could have all of the faith correct and be completely heart-wise having no love for God. It's a, it's a very common, and common, that's not controversial. Every Roman Catholic knows that, that you can have no love for God but have a faith or a dead faith or whatever you want to call it. And so it would be purely intellectual or something like that. Well, orthodoxy would even say that dead faith can't be purely intellectual. Right? You can't have correct knowledge of God without a correct repentance or seeking of God. Just the, the two have to go together because of the way the East views human anthropology. So back to knowing God. So the question of the way that God reveals himself to us is an action on the part of God. It's not something that we cause to happen. It's purely initiated from God's side. And God has chosen out of his goodness, which is a divine energy, to reveal these manifold aspects of himself, right? These actions of himself. And what the great thing about this is that unlike me or you, uh, you know, I might, I might, uh, you know, 
like get mad at you and flip you the bird, like you're not participating in this action of flipping the bird if you turn the camera off and go away, right? You're done with it, right? You're done with this conversation. You're done with me. Well, the good thing about God is that the the attributes and, and actions of God are such that we are able to participate in them. And that's how we join him. And that's how through grace we join him. So grace in the Eastern view is the energies of God. So they're, it's the attributes of God, right? So Western theology would say these are kind of uh, discursive sort of propositions that we list about uh, God is just, God is uh, good, he has foreknowledge, he does this, providence, and, and it's this sort of list of categories that we classify God as one of many things out there, right? So this is kind of goes to that idea of chain of being, which I would say Roman Catholicism is impregnated with this older Greek idea of the, the chain of being. And at the top of this chain of being is kind of the super, super being, uh, the monad or God. And all the being that, that comes down, down from him, this, 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 this chain, and then you get down to hell where it's like non-being uh, in this scheme. And this is very, a very heavily influenced. Uh, so if I can interrupt you just a little bit. Um, the, the crux of it is that the East has always said that God has essence and energy, uh, and the West has, uh, later, not early on, but later on said, because they were so devoted to the Greek concept of Greek philosophy concept of simplicity and the monad, they said that you can't have a distinction in God of essence and energy. And so instead of listening to the several centuries of church fathers who said, yes, there is, there's essence and energy, and, and that be your starting point, their starting point was Greek philosophy, which said there's simplicity, there's a, no, a monad that cannot be divided or distinct in any way, and because we're so devoted to that, we're not going to listen to the church fathers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, when Augustine, and it's Augustine who really begins the unfortunate trend of moving things in that way, and I want to be fair to Augustine because uh, I was Fifth century. Devoted. Yeah, as a Roman Catholic, I was very devoted to him. So I read thousands of pages of Augustine. I know his thought very well. Early Augustine, uh, in the soliloquies, is a very, very rationalistic Platonic person. And he wants to try to use Platonism to, apologetically speaking, aid his Christian approach. Uh, and so what you see in Augustine's life, interestingly, is a long trek of moving out of that and more and more into a more appreciative view of Scripture, a more appreciative view of Revelation, even though at his latest days it was still very influenced by a lot of Neoplatonism, things like that. So how might that be? Well, I mean, he was a Platonist for a while, by the way, I should add, before he converted. Uh, well, in his idea, Platonism was so important in, in, in describing the world in terms of metaphysics and philosophy that it had to be also true for the way that we understood God. And so, for example, Plotinus has a discussion, I think, in the fifth book of the Aeneids where he talks about uh, his version of a trinity and how the third uh, pr uh, emanation of the trinity is this hypostasis that is love, and then it comes from the principle of the first two. And this is the idea of filioque in Plotinus. We know Augustine was very influenced by, by Plotinus, and I think that this is a good contender, at least for why he thought that the doctrine of the eternal procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son would be helpful in Christian theology, although it's not. But that's a different issue. But what, I, the, what we want to, the, the key point we want to get here is that Augustine thought that man was fallen such to the extent that the only way that he could properly um, understand God was by God giving a kind of prevenient and then irresistible grace. And this prevenient and then irresistible grace also included a kind of illumination theory. So this is actually an area where he differs from Aquinas on how man knows God. Now, they're kind of ultimately in the big picture in the same camp, but they do have a little bit of difference on how this knowledge comes to us from God, because Aquinas will, in this question, side a little more with Aristotle, and Augustine will side a little more with Plato. So one thing I did want to correct in your your um, 
statement about Aquinas and the and the reformers is that the reformers didn't really follow Aquinas so much as attempting to to kind of go to Augustine and pick up this Platonism in a way, this direct sort of uh, peering into the divine uh, and ultimately divine essence, unfortunately. Uh, and what they did was try to apply that to scripture. And this is where in Protestant theology we have what's called the analogy of fide. So two terms here we're going to use uh, analogy of fide. That's the analogy of faith. So if you were to ask the classical Protestant, how do you know God? He would say, we do know God by analogy, and those analogies are in the Bible. That's pretty much the only place. And you'll find disputes amongst the Protestants in, t in terms of how well we can actually know God from nature or creation. Many of them have a pretty negative view about that. You can't really, you know, gain natural knowledge of God from creation. So they would differ from Aquinas pretty pretty consistently. A Calvin would, for example. Aquinas, on the other hand, has this view that will be called analogia entis, and that is just the uh, Latin term for the analogy of being. And this is a philosophical notion that all created things in some way mirror God. And so we can reason back from the created causes or excuse me, the created effects of God back to the first cause. And this is the whole basis of Aquinas's cosmological argument, right? We see all these things, they got to come from somewhere. We can reason back to a first cause. And we might think, we might posit things like, well, that first cause can't have been caused. So he was an unmoved cause, an unmoved mover, right? So we start to get some level of propositional knowledge or conceptual knowledge about God from discursive philosophical reasoning about creation in Aquinas's view. Augustine wouldn't really say that. He would say that we do look at creation and we can see that there's a creator, but that knowledge is a kind of direct peering to the forms that stand behind created things. And that would be the Platonic idea. And what are these forms? They're eternal ideas that are in the essence of God. And so what, what, this is called exemplarism, divine exemplarism. And so the exemplars, or Plato's forms for Augustine, are sort of smushed into the divine essence, if you will. And so in that view, it's not really the creation that matters so much as it is the kind of direct peering into the meanings of things that are in God and in his essence behind all these created. The created things are kind of like mirrors, right? They kind of like show us these kind of faint fuzzy ways into, oh, I can kind of see what the divine essence is through this created thing. In Aquinas, it's not like that. It's, oh, here's this created thing. Hmm, it has all these properties. It must have come from somewhere. Well, that thing that it came from is, you know, bigger than this. It's, uh, it must have, you know, uh, spawned this somehow all the way back through this sort of chain of causes. And how do I know that? Well, I know that because I have an intellect that can that can grasp what he calls a phantasm or a form uh, in, in, in this is Aristotle's anthropology. I can kind of draw out of this created object a form. And in this, and in my mind, I have a mirror of the universal or the form that is probably in God, right? This is in the and, divine. And, and for the listener out there uh, uh, who kind of is slow at getting this like I am, uh, just remember that when when someone like Aquinas begins to talk about you know God by analogy, not directly, whereas right. the church fathers yes. always taught that you can know God directly through his energies, that's the chasm right there. That or that's the that's the small small uh little mm -hmm. fissure that, that seems like it, but that's what that's what creates the chasm down the road that leads to right. modern this nihilism and, you know, uh where we are today. And this would lead to, but I want to be fair because the people will be listening to this and they'll say, well, that's not really Augustine's view. He doesn't say what Aquinas said. I know that, but what Augustine says is still more in the camp of Aquinas because what Augustine thinks we see through created things is kind of appearing into the divine essence, even if faintly. And in Eastern and Western theology, this is why you'll, probably put two and two together, you'll think, oh, now I see why Western theology eventually developed the idea of the beatific vision, that the afterlife consists in a vision of God's essence. And this is blatantly what Aquinas teaches. 
Uh, that's not ever taught in the East. In fact, the East would say that's pretty close to being heretical, depending on what you mean. And it does appear that what Aquinas means by it uh, is, is a, a literal seeing of the divine essence. Now, Eastern theology says, look, let's go back to Moses like we talked about at the beginning. <clears throat> when Moses went up the mountain, God says, no man can see me and live. And yet Moses saw the backside of God. He saw his goodness, mercy, right? So did he see God? Well, he did and he didn't. He didn't see God in his essence because no man can see that and live. But he did see God in some partial sense, some some piecemeal revelation, which is an energy, right? And so he really did see God. And so when the East says that there's a dis distinction between God's essence or what he is in himself and God add extra out towards the world and towards creation, his, his energies. We're not saying that there's parts in God. We're not saying that God's split. We're not saying that there's, there's some, uh, that he's cut up in any way. Uh, he's not composite, what, what I'm meaning to say, uh, because every one of the divine energies is fully and totally God, but it's not God in his essence. Now the, the West has a problem with this. And this is, that's the crux of it. And they say, how can you say that? That would mean, if there's a distinction in God, that God is composite or has parts. And no simple being can can have distinction or parts. Now, the Eastern Church teaches God is simple. The divine essence is absolutely simple, but even that is a negative statement or an apophatic statement, meaning that we don't know even what that means. It's, it's, a, it's a statement that is intended to fend off human reason from going beyond those bounds. All we know is that we don't know what, what that is, and we'll never know what the divine essence is. And that's why the seraphim can't look at God. Now, you say, but but we see God, right? The Bible says we're going to see God. We see him face to face. Exactly. Now, how do we do that? Well, because God is able, he has the means and the power, to condescend, to come to man directly through the divine energies. Now, does that mean that churches don't matter, or Bible doesn't matter, or None of this stuff matters. Now, some people would say that. They would say, yeah, that means don't worry about sacraments, don't worry. None of this stuff, that's all relative. All you need is like a Quaker kind of sit in your chair and like, no, because God made the world good. He gave us bodies, right? He gave, he, he, he prepared a body, as the psalm says, for the Messiah, uh, David says. So bodies in the world are good, he says in, in, in Genesis when he creates, and, and God said it was good. So there's nothing bad, there's nothing diminutive or destructive about matter or the created world. In fact, it was made to be raised, and we believe that there's nothing hindering God from creating things like matter or, or uh, giving things form or limitation that, it, that in any way is, is in itself evil or bad. That's all Greek philosophy. Knows, right? When Christ reveals himself to us in, uh, uh, it, uh, when he came to earth, uh, is, is that through his energies, uh, not his essence? Correct. Well, we should also mention this. This is another problem that uh, both <coughs> Roman Catholicism and Protestantism has. And this is the, the Eastern theological distinction between nature and person. And all this means is that you and I, Dean, share human nature, right? So it's common. It's universal in the world to all humans. We have the same nature or essence. But we're different in that you're the hypostasis of person D, I'm the hypostasis of person J. So personhood is particular, and nature or essence is common. And they're distinct, right? They're not the same thing. And we believe, as all the Eastern Fathers teach unanimously, and all the creeds teach, all the, all the, the councils teach, that God's nature is not the same thing as his person, right? And so we don't have a problem making distinctions in God, and at the same time believing that God is fully one. He's whole, and that's because God reveals himself to us as personal, right? This is what all the fathers teach, despite what some modernist orthodox say. Uh, they would say that you can't even use terms like person for God, but that's ridiculous. The Bible speaks that way. So when God reveals himself to us, it's not like we have some sort of concept of an energy and that we kind of like peer through creation as a veil to some energy. It's not like that. It's rather that there's a meeting with a person face-to-face, -face, like you and I are having this personal interaction, and we, we understand that 
the basis of all creation and all created reality is itself personal and it is summed up in this God, right? So the energies of God are personal energies, and that's what's key to, to, to see here, because if you're new to this, you might hear me talking about it and think energy, well, that's like electricity or something. That's like a, a force. It's not a force. It's personal. So in the same way that I, if I were to go out and, you know, like, say, uh, declare my love for a girlfriend or something, right? If I say this to Jamie, that relationship that conveyance of that energy of love is a personal thing. It's not an impersonal force. It comes from a hypostasis, a person, right? And it's an operation or an action or an energy. Well, in the same way, God loves humanity. He loves his creation. And he loves the world. And this is a, an outflowing energy of God. It, it, God is nothing but goodness flowing out from himself, right? That is grace. So... <clears throat> Uh, did the uh, did did the church, you know, Jesus Christ, the apostles, whoever, John the theologian, did they bring really a a new, maybe a better paradigm to the planet uh, than what the Greek philosophers had, which was the simplicity, the one, the monad? Did mm -hmm. they bring something? Uh, they brought a personal God. You know, God in Aristotle is thought thinking himself. He's all wrapped up within himself, and he's kind of a pure intellect. Uh, Aristotle did, interestingly, say that God's, whatever sense he relates to the world, is love, that love makes the world go around. Uh, but he did not believe that you could kind of have a personal relationship with that God or that you were going to have an afterlife with that God or anything like that. Uh, no resurrection, nothing like that. Right? Paul says the Greeks think resurrection is foolishness. Uh, Plato, of course, the monad is purely simple. It's an abstraction. It's a kind of, um, it's almost mathematical, right? So it's kind of a Pythagorean notion of a mystical view of numbers, like one, two, three to ten. That's the tetractus, which uh, Pythagoras puts into a. So I, I I get that 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 Christ and the apostles brought personhood, uh, but they also brought three, three persons. So it's a it's a it's a it's a one in the many. Uh, well, this is it is right, but this is also important to make the distinction that we we believe that although it was not totally clear, uh, Christ and the apostles didn't bring that. It was the Jews that brought that. So the revelation to uh, Moses and to the the prophets is the teach also the teaching of the Trinity and the coming divine Messiah. So, for example, the angel of the Lord, the theophanies that occur in the Old Testament, we believe that is the Logos. That is the second person of the Godhead manifesting himself in through divine energies, even in the period of the Law and the Prophets. Okay, when Moses went up on the mountain, James says he saw Christ. So it's, it's not explicated until the time of the fullness of Revelation, which is the coming of the Messiah, but it's there implicitly, uh, and it's 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 Again, in seed form, I guess you could say it's implicit, right? So it's not like we're gonna be able to go back in a time machine and ask Abraham if he, you know, has the orthodox view of the Trinity, because <laughs> he's not going to. But he did, as Paul says, as Hebrews says, look forward to a divine Messiah. Yeah, right? and, and believed, Paul says he believed the gospel. And Elohim, you know, in the beginning God created the earth. Elohim is plural. Right now. This is important because it's this area actually shows a, the strong contrast between what Augustine thinks and what we think. Augustine actually says in On the Trinity that those theophanies in the law are just created manifestations that kind of come and disappear. They're like holograms for all intents and purposes. Why does he say that? He says that because, in his mind, the absolute simplicity of God cannot, by its very nature, by its very definition, come into time and space and show itself. Why? Because that would mean the divine essence could in some way be seen or shown or imaged in creation. That's his line of reasoning in on the Trinity explicitly. That's the night and day opposite of what all the Eastern Fathers teach, that the th all the theophanies of the Old Testament are the Logos, the second person of the Godhead, uh, pre-signifying the coming of the Messiah. You know, the, the wrestling with the angel, uh, Joshua seeing the angel of the Lord, right? This is all Jesus. Now, the New Testament says it many times, but so do all the Eastern Fathers. But Augustine, because of these philosophical presuppositions, has a problem with that in trying to fit it into the idea that the divine essence 
is absolutely simple and cannot be subject to any change, any temporality, any manifestation of parts, right? So if the divine essence manifested in the Old Testament in a theophany, that would mean that it has parts and that it can enter into time and space. It can't. Now, you start to think about that. Well, that becomes problematic because it also means that the second person of Trinity can't become incarnate. Now, Augustine is just simply inconsistent because he does obviously believe in the incarnation of the second person of Trinity. But that idea that he has about simplicity, I think, shows that if you're really consistent with it, there could be no incarnation because the incarnation is the second person of the Godhead. Now, in Aquinas' theology, nature and person are absolutely the same. They're only human conceptual distinctions, Aquinas says. And he says the exact same thing about the attributes or actions of God. They're only conceptual, formal distinctions. They're not real. Orthodoxy says no. The energies of God are different even from themselves at times. Okay, So foreknowledge is not the same thing as God's justice or his love. And, and that should be obvious. right? The act of creating is not the same thing as foreknowledge. And that should be obvious because that makes no sense. And then when you, if you really start ferreting that out, it becomes absurd because every act of God is his divine essence and is therefore eternal and infinite. So when Jesus walked on water, that was the same thing as a divine essence because it was a divine action to walk on water. And it was also the same thing as the creation of the world. And it was also the same thing as God's justice. I mean, it, it just makes no sense, but it's all based on a philosophical presupposition. And that article you mentioned, I pulled out the Aquinas quotes that show that. Uh, now, why? Why do they have this view? Because in their mind, it's just part of philosophy. Everybody knows in philosophy that what it means to be simple means that you can have no distinctions. Because distinction, Plato said, equals dialectical tension or opposition. Eastern theology is all about, especially if you read the councils, it's all about balance, it's about harmony, and it's about avoiding dialectical tensions. There's no tension between the one and the many. Saying that something is distinct does not entail that it's divided or composite. For example, everyone at least appears to admit that the Father is not the same as the Son in terms of their personhood, but that doesn't mean that there's a division, right? So if a person who believed in absolute simplicity was really consistent with the view, it would lead to something like Islam or Judaism, right? Because that's what they say. They say, look, we believe in simplicity like you in the divinity, uh, and, and if you think that division, or if you think that distinction entails division, then a distinction between father and son, if it's real, means that God is composite. So the problem is it a contradiction. It's an inconsistency. It's not a question of whether Aquinas was, you know, intentionally trying to lead everybody into atheism or something like that. I don't think he was. I don't think Augustine was. Uh, you know, Augustine is at least a blessed in the Eastern Church. So he's not completely cast out because many of his writings are orthodox and are solid. You know, City of God, for example. So <clears throat> that uh, that's the, the real crux of the matter is, again, how do we know God? How do we relate to him? And when I say that the energies are personal, that means that God reveals himself to us in a relationship form that's communal, that is person to person, divine person to human person, in the case of us relating to him. And the chief way that he does this is in, the, is, is in the incarnation, right? So the Bible and created things and icons, it's very similar to the incarnation. And this is the way all the fathers talk about the relationship of God to the world and to these various things is patterned on God who foreknew from the foundation of the earth that the lamb would be slain, right? It's all patterned on the incarnation. And that's why the East says, even if Adam hadn't fallen, there would have been an incarnation because that was always God's plan to raise man to higher and higher and higher levels of communion with him into all eternity. In fact, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nyssa says that we will forever and always be moving up into God, right? Learning and knowing and, and communing and greater union with God because God's infinite. There's no end to that. You know, it always gets better and better and better. Uh, and so the, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing heretical or there's no, there's nothing wrong with saying that there's, gradations and growth even in eternity, right? And that's why the, the East, for example, believes that energy and operation and movement will continue on in, into eternity. In Aquinas' view, there's almost no place for the body because what is the, the, the final state? The beatific vision of the intellect seeing the divine essence. 
And that is not only is it heretical, but it has no place for the body. What's the point of the resurrection, right? It's this world that is redefined and deified that goes on into eternity. At least what all the Eastern Fathers teach. So very different view there. It's all all across the board. What you see is that this issue hinges two totally different perspectives that go down two totally different paths. And that's where we get to the point of moving into the empiricism and the atheism and so forth. Now, so Gregory Palamas, St. Gregory Palamas, when he debated this very topic, uh, you could say in a way he was debating with a guy who was kind of Thomistic, but actually Barlam, the Calabrian, was more Augustinian. Gregory Palamas. Mm -hmm. And so then here's, and here's, the, here's the very ugly Barlam. <laughs> All of these issues come to a head at this period that you're talking about here. This is around 1300 or so. And Barlam says, as an Augustinian, he's like, I, he says, I can't understand what you guys are talking about. Because we believe that, you know, uh, uh, that created forms and images lead us back to God. And it's, it's not really a direct perception of God that we have. It's only these created forms these created analogies through the analogy, uh, the analogy of uh, interest, the analogy of being, and that in the afterlife, you know, we'll have some perception of God. Well, St. Gregory says, <clears throat> when, when the apostles were on Mount Tabor, and they were talking to Christ, and they saw the divine light coming out of him, what was that? Well, Barlam says, well, I would follow Augustine and say that that was some created light. And... <laughs> St. Gregory replies and says, they call him God when they see that. It's the light of God, right? Paul says to Timothy, God dwells un in unapproachable divine light, right? That's not created. That is the uncreated divine light of God. So you start to see the difference in those kinds of examples, right? L let me also, let me point out that uh, the uh, the controversy with, if I got this right, with Barlam and Gregory uh, of Palamas, which was 14th century uh, debate, started because Barlam was uh, traveling uh, somewhere in, in, in the Eastern Empire, um, He and he had sentiments with the West, but uh, he went to a monastery where they were praying all day. Um, and Eastern monetary, Monastery, which is the, the tradition in many of the Eastern monasteries, is for monks to pray all day. Whatever they're doing, they say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, Barlam thought that this was a waste, that they should be spending their time studying. Uh, that's what you should, that's what would be, would be the proper use of your time. And this is based on exactly what we're talking about, is that in the East, there is the, a belief that you can know God directly, you can experience God directly, and through that ascetic life of prayer, you can tap into that. And from that, the rest of us, you know, benefit and learn from people who are, you know, who are tapping into God himself and his energies and learning from him. Whereas in the West, they say, no, you, you need to spend your time studying books. Yeah, but it's also important to understand that Eastern theology doesn't disparage or cast aside human reasoning and the intellect and the analytical. All the Eastern fathers teach that as well. They don't say that that's the pinnacle. Right. Those are kind of uh, Maximus, for example, St. Maximus Confessor says, I when I contemplate creation, I contemplate then behind that creation, the meanings and principles behind them, so to speak. And those meanings and principles are eternal patterns. He says, Logoi, that lead me up the mountain to the vision of God. So there's nothing bad in creation. Creative forms are not their means by which we ascend the ladder to God. And have direct perception. Yeah, I mean, uh, but that but that direct perception, it's important to understand, never obliterates the faculties of man. It might transcend, but transcending doesn't equate to the obliteration of reason or the obliteration of intellect, right? So, the, just like with the noose, the eye of the mind, which is the organ by which we do this, it doesn't mean that it throws away intellect or it throws away reason or it throws away the heart, right? The the faculties that function all together in one. So in the same way that God transcends words, he can still speak to us and convey truths about himself to us in creative forms of words. 
the same with icons, the same with any creative form or pattern, the same with the body of Jesus, which becomes the vehicle to me. Right, so not, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but just saying that rationality and study and books and all that has its place, very important place, but it, it's, it's to be subjected just beneath the heart and the noose and the eye of the soul, which, which directly connects with God. And that's because one can't approach God and gain truth about God apart from the heart being set right. And in Western theology, you can. You can study God as a science in a way. Aquinas calls theology the top of the sciences. But in our view, it's not like analytical knowledge. Analytical knowledge is like created things pointing you to God, but they're not the same as God. And so in the same way, the, the conceptions that we have in our mind of who God is are not fully a, a, to be equated with God, obviously, because we have a finite thought, right? So that's why God takes mortality and fuses his energies into us without us ever losing our creatureliness to be raised up to newer and higher and higher levels. That's, the again, the ascent of the mountain uh, that the Eastern Fathers use is not some point where you stop and then you're done. Like it's a, it's a constant ascent where we're always moving up into God, as St. Gregor Nyssa says. So, <clears throat> so the created things are not ever to be disparaged, uh, and this is what is so important about the final state or the, the eternal state or whatever, uh, that makes it distinct from uh, from Aquinas, because Aquinas doesn't really have, a, as I said, he doesn't really have a place for the body. It's almost like in Thomistic theology, in the beatific vision of eternity, it's only, he says, it's only appearing into the divine. It's almost like you just watch a TV screen of the divine essence. That's you know, that's all eternity in Aquinas. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm also not joking. So uh, <clears throat> if, if, if created things were, were somehow lesser or to be disparaged, then God wouldn't continue the body on into eternity, right? But it's not, it's, 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 it's raised up, it's moved to a higher level, higher plane. And that's why, for example, when Jesus is resurrected, he still has a body with the potential for solidity, but it's also not bound by space and time in that he appears in the midst of the disciples and disappears, right? So, <clears throat> yet it still marks who he is with, you know, this Thomas putting his fingers in, into the side. So it's still that same body, but it's that same body transfigured. And so in the same way for us, that glorification happens, but it doesn't destroy or do away with the idea of gross matter or some Gnostic idea. Right. And so what I'm what I'm saying is that the, the pattern for everything, so the proper the proper way to understand it is just the incarnation. And so in, once once the incarnation theology is solid, everything else lines up. There's no. That's why the church hammered that out first, right? Because everything else will fall into line. You're not ever going to have any of the problems about how God relates to the world, for example, through smashing God into the world in pantheism, because the incarnation prevents that. How? Well, because in Christ, there's two natures that are never completely fused or confused, but they are meshed in a, uh, they are united in in their uh inability to be separated and they retain their the, the properties they retain the attributes proper to each nature in a perfect union and as the fathers say the energies of christ the divine person deify his humanity so when christ the second person of the godhead took on his fallen human nature which it was because it was subject to death and yet he did not sin and then he resurrected and raised it up, that becomes the means by which we, by participating in his deified body, will achieve also deified bodies. And it's not just our bodies, but as many of the Eastern Fathers say, what is not assumed in the Incarnation is not healed. Man has a rational soul, a body, noose. All these faculties become healed in the participation in Christ. And so he's a son by nature. We become sons of God through adoption. And that adoption is not legal, it's metaphysical, it's ontological, it's real. And that's what John 17 says, where Jesus promises that we will participate in the same love that he has between the Father and the, between himself and the Father. We will be sons like he is a son, although we will never be, of course, the creator. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Reformation because there's a lot of Protestants uh, listening to this podcast. Um, so let's talk about Luther, Calvin, or, uh, or various Protestant leader, uh, leaders, and what uh, in what way did they inherit this uh, bad theology from the West? Right. Well, interestingly, on the on the question of the divine essence, <clears throat> almost everything that I've ever looked at across the board, um, the reformers are one hundred percent in the same camp because many of them are going to follow Augustine. A lot of, they're not really going to like Aquinas, maybe one or two, but most of them are not going to like Aquinas and they're going to side with Augustine. So they're going to be more in that camp of preferring a kind of disparagement of creation. Uh, so that you can have this kind of direct mental path to God, right? This illumination theory uh, of, of, of Augustine uh, that thinks that the illumination comes through the Bible, right? For the Protestants. For Augustine, it comes through many kind of sacraments in the church and mystical contemplation and so forth, asceticism, prayer. Uh, <clears throat> but for the Reformers, it will be a question of it'll come through prayer and through meditation on the Bible and hearing the preaching of the Bible. That's the means by which we're going to know God in Protestantism across the board. Why? Well, because God is absolutely simple, and he's that being that we can only know through Christ, but we only know Christ through the means that he's established, and that is baptism, Lord's Supper, and the text of Scripture, which are all symbolic, right? And so they're symbolic forms. might not be inspired. The you know, Bible's inspired, but it's still a symbolic form that is only up to the action of God to say, at this point in time, I now put my spirit in this person. And for Luther and for Calvin and for all those pers those early reformers, classic reformers, this action of God to decide to put his spirit in this or that person is all based on his eternal foreknowledge or, or his, his eternal predestination, right? <clears throat> in this regard, you have an overriding of human nature, because human nature is seen to be fallen, such that it doesn't have the ability to do any movement towards God. Uh, you know, obviously in Calvinism, total depravity, Luther, Luther has a whole book called Bondage of the Will, where he goes even further than Calvin, believe it or not. So God, in those views, sees man as a kind of legal category of completely wicked, to make things simple. And the only way for man to get out of that state, of course, is for God to declare that person so and put faith in him and put grace in him to whatever whatever that means, right? To declare a legal state of justified for that person. So it's far less metaphysical, and it's much more about declarative propositions and states, legal states uh, in Protestant theology. So at least in, even in Roman, Roman Catholic theology, there's the metaphysical notion of the fact that the, the person as a whole needs to be transformed and that, that this occurs through these created means and forms based on the incarnation. I mean, Roman Catholic theology at least has that idea going on there. That's not really there in Protestantism because it kind of tossed out all this philosophy. I'm not saying bad philosophy. I'm saying good philosophy. It tossed out the ecumenical councils and said, let's just go read this book. So naturally, it's going to be propositional and rational because it's, it's all about let's go read this book right and so who becomes the reformers well it becomes the guys who are the most studied academic humanists of their day right the humanist movement which stressed reading the greek text reading the hebrew text original languages and all this right and so there's a loss of the idea of the metaphysical ideas of union with god and it all becomes a kind of rational propositional legal category, to make it simple. Now, <clears throat> that in philosophy is called nominalism. Nominalism is the movement away from the idea that um, there are essences of things or natures of things in the world, right? Nominalism says the when you think that a thing has a nature or an essence, that you have human nature, that there's whatever created natures out there, those are just human terms. You're not describing something actually out there. It's just words that are symbols for phenomena out there in the external world. So that's nominalism. That's to be distinguished from something like Platonism or realism or any any orthodox ideas and so forth. Were the reformers empiricists? 
no, to be fair. Uh, in a way, they are because they believe that we know God through reading the Bible, right? You don't get knowledge of God from cre creation, really, um, because there's no natural knowledge of God. They reject Aquinas' idea of nature teaching you anything about God. The only source of knowledge about God is the Bible, strictly speaking. So none of the other things really matter. Uh, and in fact, they might be distractions or turn into idols because you might think those things lead you to God and they're created things that, you know, or that would be idolatrous, right? Uh, so, um, so nominalism then, it is directly connected to its later successor empiricism. And empiricism says that we only know what we know through our five senses, right? So there's a way in which Protestantism will eventually get to empiricism, absolutely. But to be fair, the early reformers, many of them, and many of the Puritans, they were not empiricists, believe it or not. They were actually Platonists, and many of them are explicit about it. Maybe not so much uh, Calvin, but, but other reformers were realists. They would say that there is some real sense in which God, when he declares you just, it, it, simply by that divine fiat, it causes a change in your being. So that's a version of realism that they have, right? Um, many of the uh, uh, many of the Puritans believe that predestination was true because of all of creation being a reflection of the eternal ideas that are in divine, in God's essence. Now, if the ideas of all creation are in God's essence, and the ideas of all those created things are then for, therefore eternal because they're in the divine essence, then it was settled from all eternity that God would create and that every event hap that happens in history would happen as it happened. Right. So it's a, it's a, it fits well with the strict predestinarianism like many of the Puritans had. So they would actually just say that everything that, that we see in this world is just uh, a predestined reflected mirror of the divine essence. And some of them literally speak that way. Stephen Charnock, for example. So <clears throat> that setting that caveat aside, the rest of them, at least a couple generations later, will all become just naive empiricists for the most part. Uh, in Kant, oddly enough, you'll get this weird pietism. Kant is raised in German pietism, which says, forget all these creeds, forget this Bible stuff. You might read the Bible for moral messages here and there. Um, but yes, ultimately, I'm an empiricist, he says, because he read David Hume and David Hume destroyed his ideas of metaphysics who's the radical empiricist, David Hume. And so Christianity or religion for Kant is just a retreat into prayer and devotion. And that was the kind of German religious movement that he grew up in, which was a reaction to German Protestant scholasticism, right? So the early stages of German, of the Reformation in Germany, Luther, uh, Melanchthon, there's, there developed this very scholastic version of what Lutheranism would be. And it was called that because it was almost like Aquinas or the medieval Catholic scholastics. And then it was like, you know, these thousand page treatises on, you know, what the Lutheran specifications of all this, 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 this are. Do you have, a, so, do you, do you have any idea as to why the, um, uh, the, the, the bit of Platonism that the early reformers had mm -hmm. um, and not, a, uh, not an empiricist model? Uh, they had it gave way, why, why it gave way to it so quickly? Why did it, why did they lose that so quickly? Yeah, uh, I would say because number one, because of the the larger ideological currents of the Enlightenment, which would come pretty soon after the Reformation, and the the entire ideological current of the Enlightenment is pretty much empiricism. You might be able to find some obscure weirdo guys who still like Plato in the Enlightenment, maybe, uh, maybe Newton. But so the reformers had some sort of uh, commitment to a, 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 a Platonic view that was not empiricist, but because they were not steeped in well, the Eastern teachings uh, and the and and the councils, they they did they just couldn't withstand the onslaught some, of the some, culture. Some of them were Calvinist. Uh, like maybe Turretin, uh, would be moving in that more platonic direction. 
Calvin, I'm not really sure about. I don't know that he ever talks. He, he pretty much would disparage Plato. But what I'm saying is that the ones that really had an affinity for Augustine adopted and imbibed much of his Platonic ideas, right? The, the whole notion that creation is patterned after divine ideas in God's essence. So another reason, uh, aside from the empiricist ideological current that I think moved Protestantism very quickly out of that, uh, at least in Germany for sure, is, as I said, you mentioned nominalism. Actually, Luther was very influenced by a famous nomina nominalist named Gabriel Bile. And there's a famous book by Heiko Obermann uh, about the connection between Luther and Gabriel Bile. G Gabriel Bile was one of these Catholic guys like William of Ockham who denied any real, real essences or natures in the world. And that is useful because it, it's a means if you're a Protestant for saying all this stuff that you're talking about out there in the world, like these, these sacraments or these, you know, this Eucharist and all this kind of stuff that none of that matters. There's no, there's not a priest that you need to make this happen. God makes it happen by his divine will. It's so, you can call this, as it will be later formulated in, in stricter Calvinism, it's called um, divine voluntarism. So that everything that exists is only what it is because God simply wills it to be that. God didn't make a world with beings and creatures to have natures in themselves. It's just divine fiat. And this is where you, you probably heard the, the, the idea that, well, there was these debates in the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, about could God, if he so chose, damn the Virgin Mary? Like, so Mary's in heaven, right? Could could God will to damn her? How do you how do you know? Well, this idea, the nominalist idea, the vol this divine voluntarism, they said, yeah, because there's nothing binding the will of God. The will of God is the source of all creation. The will of God is a divine essence, and so God can do whatever he wants. He's not bound by anything, even by his own nature. Why? Because the will of God is the nature of God, right? So it's all, again, based on, it's another version of weird error from absolute simplicity, but that's another reason for the movement away from Platonism is because <clears throat> this is what Barlium and Gregor Palamas say, and this is an area where St. Gregory is prophetic. St. Gregory actually says to Barlium, if you continue with your presuppositions, he says, it, it leads to atheism. And what happened in the West was the continuance of the essence, the, the substance of Barlium's presuppositions and it led to atheism. So my idea for that article, how Western theology you know, led to atheism, I, I just got it from what St. Gregory Palamas said. Barlam, Gregory Palamas. Now, why did Gregory say that? Well, Barlam said to him, we believe that God's active essence, that God is his active essence, and that he has no other activity other than his essence because he would be composite if we said that. So that's everything I've been saying so far in the talk about divine simplicity and, oh, if you admit a distinction in God, then that, that leads to division or composition in God. And Gregory responds, responds by saying that no one knows the essence of God, but we do know God. And so we know God by his, <laughs> by his energies. And he, of course, cites a litany of all the Eastern fathers who have always taught that. Now, for Roman Catholics, and I want to point out as well, there's a very... A great statement by Pope St. Agatha, one of the uh, Orthodox popes of the West, at the Sixth Council, where they are describing Christology. And the definition that he gives, that he believes is Orthodox, and it is, is that he says, we believe in Christ. There's two divine, nat there's two natures, divine and human, two wills, divine and human, and two energies, divine and human, right? So he makes all the distinctions that we make. And he says that they retain their natures as they are created and uncreated. And the divine energies deify the fallen humanity of Christ, his flesh, in the resurrection, glorify it. That's the pattern for our resurrection and glorification. And so the Pope taught that there's a distinction between essence and energy uh, in the Christology of the Sixth Council. So <clears throat> that, I think, should be enough. And by the way... Where did he get that? The Sixth Council's teaching is based on the teaching of St. Maximus the Confessor. So, for example, there's a great book 
And this is uh, Maximus's debate. St. Maximus the Confessor, 7th century. This is Maximus's debate with the monothelite Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus taught that the divine is such that it overrides anything that might come in contact with it. <clears throat> so in Christ, how can we say he has a human will? Because the divine simply took over, right? He's a divine person, and persons are the ones who will, right? No. Orthodox theology says that will is a property of nature, and that's why we don't believe there's three wills in God. God has one will, three hypostases, and that's why will is a property of nature. For humans, will is a property of nature. We all share a common human will, but that willing is exercised personally, if that makes sense. I know that gets a little confused, but yeah. if you read Maximus's debate with Pyrrhus, he'll uh, explain why that is. Now, the, how is that relevant to Protestantism? Well, it's the exact same idea of Calvinism. Calvinism says that when we're saved, the divine will overrides the human, because the human will is so entrapped with constantly sinning all the time, total depravity, right, bondage of the will, that it takes the divine will overriding our human energy and in some way kind of bumping us back on the right path, but we still sin, right? So <clears throat> they believe in monergism. Monergism, that is, the, that God's energy overcomes our human will in salvation, <clears throat> in conversion, in regeneration, in Calvinism, right? So what happens is you have the destruction of human nature, and will is a faculty of human nature. Uh, we don't believe that conversion, salvation ever replaces or destroys or overrides anything about human nature. It only raises it and deifies it and heals what's already there, but might be, but not, not might need to be healed. And so that's why, for example, in the incarnation, Christ took on fallen human nature. It's fallen in that the fact that he was able to die, right? And this is how St. Cyril of Alexandria uh, formulates this. He says that the human, fa the fallen human nature that Christ, the second person of the Godhead, took on, he raised up to the status of being deified and transfigured, right? And that includes all of the faculties proper to human nature, a will, uh, a rational uh, a rational mind and soul and will and body, okay? All of that is healed in Christ. And so <clears throat> we differ then from a Calvinist presentation, not in so far as we would say that God doesn't have grace or that grace is somehow something you merit, but that God creating us, period, is an act of grace, because we don't have the Thomistic distinction of nature versus grace. In Thomism, you have nature, and then grace comes and kind of stacks on top of it. That's not what we say. We say that the nature, the created natures of things, are themselves an act of grace, and that what happened was the fall bumped things off. Everything, Everything's off kilter. We now have passions that are out, out of whack. But, there, but our person itself, our nature, is still good, right? It's that rather that it has the tendency towards giving into the passions, right? But our willing, our nature, who we are in itself is not evil. And that's because there's no created thing that's inherently evil. Creation itself, matter itself, is, as God says in Genesis, good. So for Calvinism, for the Protestants, how do they say this? They have to go back to Genesis, and they say that when man fell, God took away all of his grace, and what was left there was some constant, perpetual state of sinning, right? This is wrong. This is not what we say. Right? Man did not lose all of his natural faculties, which are inherently good. He did obtain corruption, right? Sin brought death. He does tend towards self-destruction and death, towards the passions. But he's not inherently, none of these faculties are inherently bad. But in Calvinism or in Lutheranism, there's some sense in which what man has inherently has to be bad. You see? And that's why God has to declare an unrighteous, wicked person to simply be good by divine fiat. And that's the only way to be right in God's eyes. So that's the whole point of, you know, justification by faith alone and all that, which we won't go into that. But um, 
but yeah, so in other words, the whole anthropology is different, and this is what sets it off against Calvinism or Lutheranism uh, and ultimately Roman Catholicism. So it is a very different view, and it all goes back to the Incarnation and the, the Trinity's relationship to the world. Yeah, uh, as uh, we'll get, move, get close to wrapping it up here, um, the uh, one question I have for you, but, I, but let me just preface it by saying I think one of the lessons to take away from all this is, is this is what happens when you break away from the tradition of the church. So we had the first thousand years of the church, we had the ecumenical councils, we had all this solid teaching of essence and energy and how we can know God directly through his energies. And when Rome split away from the rest of the church, uh, it lost some of its connection to this historical progression and and this is what what resulted. Um, now, to add kind of insult to injury, if you will, uh, just take a couple of few minutes and, and explain uh, uh, what you said in your article that there's actually one place in some of the debates where where uh, Aquinas depended uh, not just not on a church father but on a Jewish rabbi. Yeah, he cites uh, Maimonides on the question of simplicity. So when Actually, in that in that exchange, uh, Aquinas is dealing with the fact that St. John of Damascus teaches the essence-energy distinction. And he quite clearly says that, unfortunately, John is wrong, and he's wrong because we know what simplicity means from the philosophers and from Maimonides. So, I mean, uh, we don't believe that you go to... I mean, I'm not saying that Maimonides is inherently evil, uh, but obviously, as a rabbi, he doesn't believe in the incarnation, right? So he doesn't believe in the theology that we would say. And we believe that you, you can't formulate an idea about what God is in terms of his essence in philosophy and then go to the Bible and then like read the Bible with your philosophy lenses that you just got and try to say, oh, that's what that text means. Great example for Thomism, for example, key, key version, verse, in Exodus 3, when God says, I am that I am, we would say that's a personal statement, right? God is expressing that he is a, he's personal and that it's possible to have a communal relationship with him, right? Like I might have a relationship with you, but obviously that's just an analogy, right? For Aquinas and for even the traditional Dominican and Thomistic theology, uh, you could read, for example, Etienne Gilson, who's a famous Thomist, classical Thomist. He says, we follow Aquinas in reading that text as saying, I'm not joking, uh, I am being. So when God says, I am that I am, the Thomistic view is, I am supreme being. Now, there might be a place or two in Gregor of Nyssa or Nazianzus where they might speak that way. But the question here is all what we mean by being, Right. For Gregor of Nyssa or Gregor of Nazianzus, if God says, I am superexistent being, that is just an anthropomorphism or a way of saying, I am beyond being. Okay, It's an apophatic statement, right? Because the type of being that God has is not like created being, right? There's an infinite gap between that. Uh, for Aquinas, there's not an infinite gap because being is all on a kind of continuum. That's the chain of being. So, Created beings possess being in a limited sense, and God has being in like the super sense, right? So that's how Aquinas could formulate that in such a philosophical way when, of course, none of the Jews or Hebrews who you know wrote that understood that in, in some weird chain of being way. They understood it to mean that we have a personal relationship with Yahweh, right? right. And so the Eastern Fathers, I believe, are much more faithful to that tradition of understanding that text, right? Because, you know, the teaching of Moses is apophaticism, right? That we don't see or idolize God in any created thing, right? We don't say that created form itself is God. Even the humanity of Christ is deified by the divine energies. It's not the divine essence, okay? Nor, nor is any icon or sacrament or whatever. None of those things are the divine essence. And so, Again, back to simplicity. If simplicity is true, as St. Gregor Palamas says, all you ever know about God are created effects of God. 
And that's what Barlam said. Yes, we only know the created effects, right? And if you only know the created effects of God, you don't ever have a direct experience with God. If you don't have a direct experience with God, St. Gregory says the end result of this is going to be atheism, right? Because there's no incarnation. You can't have an incarnation. If you can't have an incarnation, then the texts of the Bible that you might even go to, they're not going to help you because ultimately they're not really telling you about God. How can an eternal divine essence that's infinite come into created form and limitation and symbol in a book? You can't. It's not possible, right? Unless you believe in the essence energy distinction. Okay. Um, so in in review, uh, let me bring back out my, uh, not a timeline, but time decline. Uh, so we started with Jesus, and uh, <clears throat> about the third or fourth century, we had some good theology from Gregory the Theologian, Basil. Then we had Augustine, who had some good things, and then he had some squirrely things that were a little right. bit suspect that Jay told us about. Um, we didn't get too much into uh, 7th and 8th century Max, uh, Maximus the Confessor and John of Damascus. Uh, Jay talks about those quite a bit in some of his other lectures. Um, <clears throat> but they kind of laid down some rock-solid theology that uh, in the ecumenical councils you talked about. <clears throat> and then the East-West Schism took place about 1000 AD. So we had all this good theology. The church was doing well. Uh, and then after the East-West Schism, Rome, uh, in its philosophical and theological musings, began to drift away from what happened here in the first thousand years of the church. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Aquinas, being one of the key thinkers, uh, laid out some uh, views of God in his divine essence, uh, who could not be also known through his energies. And therefore, <clears throat> uh, it basically laid the foundation for empiricism, which is everything we know now is through sense data and what we see and hear and feel, and we can't really know things through direct revelation. Yeah, you don't know God directly in this life. Aquinas is very clear about that. Uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that view uh, in the 14th century, uh, refuted by Gregory pa Palamas, which Jay talked quite a bit, a uh, little bit, uh, refuted a guy named Balaam. Uh, what's his name? Barlam. Barlam. Uh, and then a couple hundred years after that is the Reformation. A lot of people, that's where a lot of people will start here listening to this podcast. Um, Luther Calvin and the Reformation. Uh, Human Kant, a couple hundred years later, basically take all these priests, uh, uh, all these uh, empiricist uh, type uh, premises and take them to right. their logical conclusions, which basically right. leads to kind of an atheism. And which brings us to the very bottom of the chart, which is today's occultic, uh, atheistic uh, morass. Uh, so we got Lady Gaga and the Masons and the and the and the uh, Illuminati Eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say also uh, for those who want to de delve deeper, uh, you can read the essay that I did, uh, "How the West Became Atheist," and the essay that I did, Augustine, Aquinas. Barlam and Palamas, the root of Western theological error. Those two are connected. I'll tell you what, I've, I've, uh, I also will recommend, you've got a podcast with uh, Father Moody. I don't know his first name. Uh, I've listened to that twice. It's it's really good. And then also the one you did with Father Johnson. I forget his first name. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew Johnson. Both of the, I've listened to both those twice, and they're both really good. Uh, probably a lot uh, clearer than I am. Um but uh, I, I'm just a student, so I, I, sure. the, the gift I bring to the table is asking the same kind of questions maybe other people will be asking. So, Right. So um, if you want to delve deeper into the Christology and Maximus, as I said, I recommend Disputations with Pyrrhus. Uh, this is a great 30-page essay at the beginning of that. Um, a more broad picture that will also include the Essence Energy in a, in a really, really good chapter, as well as the Filioque and the Papal Issue. Uh, is Dr. Sherrard's Greek East and the Latin West. That's a really good book. And then maybe a little more advanced, if you've gotten through some of those and you're ready for the next kind of, <clears throat> I'm not trying to be pretentious, I'm just saying it is a, a, it's not an easy book, but I would say is the next one would be Father Demetrius Daniloy's The Experience of God, Orthodox Dogmatics, Volume 1. Is he living? Uh, no. <laughs> but I think a lot, of, a lot of people think he will be a saint, probably. Okay. Kind of like Serpent Rose. So those are all good. Also, if you want to go on, of course, um, 
Stan Eloy has a volume two, which is really good. <clears throat> so, is he Greek? And, uh, he was uh, Romanian, I think. Okay. Or uh, Serbian or Romanian, but yeah. So I would uh, I would say those are good, and um, I think we touched on everything. One other thing I would say is that there is an orthodox conception of analogy, uh, and this is what we we're talking about with the logoi. And so that book that I recommended to you last time about St. Maximus will include what's called uh, one of his writings, the Ambiguum. Ambiguum 7 is about the Logoi and the Logos. And so that's the uh, archetypal ideas and patterns in creation that are in the divine mind. But the difference between Maximus and the West is that the patterns and archetypes, the Logoi, are not the divine essence. And that's where Augustine and Aquinas would disagree. They say, yeah, there's eternal patterns of things, and they are div the divine essence. And that makes creation necessary. That means that God created after an eternal pattern that emanated out of his essence, right? Because the patterns were all there in him necessarily, in his nature. No. God can have a divine idea and not do it, right? God can have infinite numbers of thoughts, right? We don't know the thoughts of God, right? They're above us. But we do know uh, that creation exemplifies a logical pattern and principle that's governed by the providence of God. And behind all creation are these principles, these logoi, these patterns, mirrors, archetypes. These are all the terms that Maximus uses. And they're all energies. They are divine energies. And they have an, a created and an uncreated aspect to them. They're uncreated insofar as they're in the divine mind. And God's mind is omniscient. But they also have a creative aspect in that they can come into be in time and space. And so that's important. That might be a little bit obscure, but that is very that is not the same thing as what Aquinas and Augustine teach about divine ideas. So Maximus's view is different. Saint uh, Father George Florovsky has a good essay on creation that talks about this and how it's different from the Thomistic view. Um, the name of that essay escapes me at this moment. You can find it online, by the way. Um, I do want I do want to pull this up because it is good. And it won't take me but a second here. I think I've got it saved. Um, and you know, just oh, here, it here it is. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to delve deeper into that, because uh, that's actually kind of been a thing I've had some some arguments with the people uh, lately. Creation and creaturehood. You can find this essay by Father. George Florovsky, uh, and he deals with that issue very well and explains how uh, the Roman Catholic view actually kind of leads to the origin origins idea that creation is necessary, that God didn't freely do it. So those are good books if you want to, you know, delve deeper. Yeah. Um, and, and to end on a positive, you know, uh, we, you know, we live in a decadent culture and so we've talked about, you know, how we slid this way and how long it took and, and where all the things are involved. But to, to be positive, there is a solution, which is to get back to the uh, councils of the church and the, his, the, the, uh, the solid teaching of the church that's always been with us. And, and so there, there is a solution and there is a way to, uh, to get out of this uh, current um, uh, moral occult, immoral occult kind of society that we live in today. Well, that's St. John's argument. That's why St. John says that all errors in anybody's worldview can be traced back to some error on God's relationship to the world and the incarnation. Hmm. Uh, now, obviously, a lot of people don't have any knowledge or concern with that, right? So they're going to have... But anybody who would be concerned with these issues, uh, or any religious person, right? He even says Islam, Judaism. He says, it, we can all trace it back to this question. And if you choose some deviance at some point on these issues, then it takes you down a track of a certain path. And that's what my article about the West was intended to convey, that when you begin with divine simplicity, as St. Gregory Palamas says, you end in atheism. It may take several centuries, may take a millennium, but that's where it goes. And if you uh, stick with the uh, historic uh, teachings of the church, it leads to uh, true worship and... Uh and knowing God. We would say glorification, yeah. All right, I'm going to stop us there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, enjoyed it. Sure. Uh, Jaysanalysis.com. Subscribe, $4.95 a month. Order his book, Esoteric Hollywood.
and we'll be looking for the TV shows pretty soon. Okay, thank you. All right, good night. Bye.